Yesterday you mentioned in your presentation that Bitcoin uh, on his way to become a good money. Mm -hmm. So how do you define what is good money is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and um, it's something that's hard to objectively define. So a lot of people have different kinds of ideas about um, how something can become a good money. Um, one of the th uh, places it's quite instructive to start is to think about um, the pathways to becoming a good money. So very often, um, things that have become used as monies uh, start off as commodities. So you can think from, you know, through human history, from when um, uh, humans start to settle and learn agriculture, or like, you know, start to um, uh, master tools for large-scale production of food, then food became a commodity, something that was valuable and in a limited supply, and therefore, um, you know, it could be used to trade. So before we had things that functioned as, as money, like say commodities that functioned as monies, uh, people used to barter. So the, the concept of barter is you know, pretty familiar to everybody. Say for example, I'm a baker and I have bread, and you have chickens and I would like some eggs. But in order for us to make a deal, make a transaction, you have to be interested in what I have, and I have to be interested in what you have, and that's what we call the double coincidence of wants. And so money is a way of solving that problem by putting a, uh, an object, uh, or some kind of abstract item in the middle. So then, you know, it's one thing if we're just changing bread for eggs, but imagine then uh, the third person is in this uh, web of, of this transaction web and they want, uh, they're a barber and they want to get haircuts. So in order for us to transact between the three of us, it starts to get much more complicated. So money is a way of solving this kind of scalable uh, barter, transactional barter situation. So um, as part of the work that I presented yesterday on token space, I, um, I kind of had to, I went through the history of money to try and understand a bit better about you know what what makes things good money. So many people like uh, Nick Zabo um, have, have you know trodden down this path, and also some more like say traditional monetary philosophers, uh, like Selden, for example, um, and 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 Simon. And so one of the interesting things we saw in in, in history, you can think about examples such as uh, shells that were used, you know, that were locally rare in a particular place, or glass beads that were locally rare in a particular part of Africa, and that would function well enough as a money in a small tribe or a small community. In England, we had tally sticks, which were literally just branches with kind of etch marks on them, and that was like the, the record-keeping system. And those kinds of systems work quite well in small groups. But when the groups get bigger, then these things, uh, they're harder to scale. And so um, we see this tendency to move from things that are locally rare to things that are globally rare. So think about precious metals, lumps of rock, uh, lumps of uh, gold and silver. These things, we think of them as quite rare. And so then they, as a commodity, although they're not really useful and consumed in the same way as, say, corn or bread or fish are, um, they can still be used as a... Um, yeah, abstract artifacts of value, uh, as long as everybody agrees that those things are valuable. Now what's interesting about gold and silver is, now I've got a background as a, as a chemist, so I used to think about these things a lot. So we think of gold and silver as very scarce, very precious, but uh, this is quite a crazy fact that there's more gold in the oceans as a very dilute solution of gold at, uh, ions than there is above ground in Fort Knox, and even there is below the ground yet to be mined. So the question is, why is there so much gold in the sea that we haven't recovered? And the answer is, it hasn't been economically uh, viable, uh, you know, given the value, current value of the current price of uh, gold and silver, to, to do that. But technology always makes these things easier to do. So as time goes on, the um, uh, capital outlay required to access those resources will go down, and eventually we will be sucking gold out of the seawater. Then, you know, think about we're just one small planet in this gigantic, you know, infinite universe. And gold comes out of supernovas, comes out of exploding stars, so it must be everywhere. Now, we're kind of planetary bound at the moment, but our civilization may not remain bound to the planet in, in quite the same way in the future. And in, even in the near future, Luxembourg has a Ministry of Space Mining already. So they're already planning, like trying to put a regulatory framework, trying to start setting up the, the um, building blocks of an industry and ecosystem around recovering precious materials from asteroids. So say we go to space or near, near orbit, just outside the planet, and it bounds, and we go and pick up trillions of dollars of, of gold and silver. So these things aren't universally rare. So um, 
then you know we can move on to the things that we find ourselves uh, discussing here at Unchain. Uh, things like cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin in particular. Mm -hmm. These things are universally rare. You know, the, the scarcity and the supply is algorithmically enforced. So those rules hold wherever you are, in essence. And so we're kind of moving from things which are locally rare to globally rare to universally rare as our society also technologically evolves. And there's another interesting uh, side point on that, which is that as we become more um, technology, our lives become more techno infused with technology, and we do more, conduct more and more of our, our business uh, in virtual mediums, what we think of as money, or what can, you know, the acceptable bounds of what might be money, the Overton window of, of what can, a good that can perform the function of money, may also be shifting towards more technological things. And this is a um, concept that Jean Baudrillard, the French monetary philosopher and absurdist uh, thinker, um, came up with as the simulacrization. So this is the idea, the simulacrum is the digital abstraction of a real thing. So think about what used to be money, lumps of gold, lumps of, met uh, lumps of metal, pieces of rock. Um, and then we made paper out of that. Then we made naive digital fiat. Now we have uh, cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. So these things are becoming more and more abstract in a sense. But because our societies are becoming also more digital and abstract, maybe that's why we're seeing these things evolving as a response to our own technological progress. So in answer to your question, what makes the money, good money, change, changes over time. Mm -hmm. Some things like the predictability of the supply, the unforgeable costliness, as Nick Zabo says, the, the difficulty of creating more, and the asymmetry of being able to verify, uh, easily verify that something is, is true and correct and within a monetary protocol or a monetary system, versus it being very hard to, to uh, manufacture. So let's take a step back into history. So there's Isaac Newton, 350 years ago. A lot of people thought after he did his groundbreaking work on calculus and gravity that he went crazy, became an alchemist, and he was trying to turn lead into gold as the master of the, the British Mint, the, the place where coins were struck from, from silver and gold. But an interesting uh, counter uh, argument or a different way to look at this was that he may have been trying to hack gold. He may have been trying to reverse engineer gold, which at that point was the most unfortunately scarce material. So he was maybe you could you could see it as this way uh, in this way that he was trying to reverse engineer gold to see if it really was as unfortunately costly to um, and unfortunately scarce as people thought at that time. So um, some scarcity, predictability of supply, ease of, of, of transfer. I mean, these are all coming back to um, Aristotle's definitions of, of what makes the good money. And then you know Jevons in the 19th century talked about these things we hear very often about stores of value, mediums of exchange, and units of account. So these are all the different kinds of functions that something that um, people start to use as a money. These seem to be the kind of, um, how can you say, like the um, admirable qualities, desirable qualities of, mm -hmm. of a money. But it's also hard to see what would make a good money in the future because our future is uncertain. We can only really see our trajectory. We can't really see the specific developments that we're going to encounter. So it's also very hard for us to say what's going to be considered good money in 50 years' time or even 10 years' time, given how quickly things, things evolve in our world. The next question I would like to ask you is about uh, the properties of a good money. And since, since we are talking about Bitcoin, what kind of properties uh, should the good money have and in terms of good, good money? Mm -hmm. So I really like to think of, and I spoke very briefly about this in my talk yesterday, there's some work by um, Nick Gogarty and Paul Johnson um, on a network theory of value. So you can think of every money as a protocol, as a, you know, as a network that is um, an implementation of a protocol. That's easy to do with something like Bitcoin because it's very literally, you know, some code that people run and that gives rise to this network and so on. Um, but you can also think of gold in that way or US dollars or, um, uh, I can't even pronounce the Ukrainian money, but uh, something like that? Yeah. Okay, all right. So each of these things, no matter you know, how widely they're used or how localized the, the monetary protocol is, essentially they're only as useful as whether people will accept uh, that, that from you. So that's kind of like the acceptability of the money. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that we see that limits the use, the current use today of cryptocurrencies is that uh, if you want wander out into the street, it's very unlikely that you'll find people that will accept uh, these things unless you specifically go looking for them. Um, and so the, that's what I call the breadth of the protocol, like how widely dispersed it. In Bitcoin, you can kind of think of it as who owns UTXOs, who runs full nodes, 
who participates in the you know um, development of the code and, and all the rest of it, uh, the miners and, and economic nodes and, and businesses and what have you. It's a bit harder to do when you think about uh, gold as a protocol network or um, tasty fish as a protocol network. So these are much smaller things. So um, the broader the network, the more acceptable the money is, um, the more likely it is that other people will adopt this, this network. And so it's one of those things that um, I guess that might be why we see very often the world kind of converges on a particular common currency or a common language or a common um, you know computing protocol um, because uh, the you know we hear dog people talk about network effects but they, they they are quite a real thing so if um, you travel to you, you say you spin the, the globe and you throw a dart at it and you travel to that country and you don't even know anything about the place you would probably if you could only take one kind of money with you uh, you would probably put dollars in your pocket because you're more, most likely that that's the most likely currency to be accepted in that in any particular place. So um, one of the real kind of nitty gritty, the most important aspects of money is like, can you really use it? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we see where, with alternative you know, altcoins and, and other crypt smaller cryptocurrencies. And they may have some you know, desirable characteristics as a commodity, but they may not be very widely accepted as a money as yet. So that's why I try to sort of differentiate how um, good a com of a commodity something is or, or its characteristics resemble uh, that of a good commodity versus uh, how much of a good money it is. Now, the sets of uh, parameters and characteristics which go into uh, figuring out how good a commodity uh, thing is as a commodity or as a money are kind of related, um, which is why the taxonomies that I built for, for the work that I showed yesterday, the taxonomies for commodities and money are very similar, but they're kind of weighted and, and prioritized differently. So, um, I mean, you know, you could, you could spend uh, years talking about the desirable characteristics of the money, but it, the most important thing is that somebody will accept it from you, and usually that is kind of accompanied by some usefulness. Now, the one exception we have is fiat currency, you know, government-issued money. It's not really useful in some innate sense. Um, so rather than that being kind of an abstraction of some innate value, that's the kind of abstraction of faith in the nation-state or the central bank or the you know, fiscal management of that particular place. So fiat money is an experiment. Fiat money is not a very long-lived experiment. We haven't really divorced um, monetary protocols from underlying value until quite recently, until like gold standards started getting abandoned, or you know, bimetallic standards getting uh, got abandoned. Um, central banks used to hold a lot of gold. You could argue that they still do, but they don't show a lot of evidence of that anymore. So um, perhaps things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are kind of a step back towards um, this more um, uh, eternal trend of uh, money having some innate value and you know, digital bearer assets being um, useful in their own right. So the, um, some of the uh, conceptual lenses that um, monetary economists use uh, are things like Gresham's Law, um, which you know, I'm not an economic expert by any stretch of the imagination, very coarsely put, Gresham's law approximates to um, the bad money will drive out the good money because mm -hmm. people will want to keep the good money for, for later. And um, and then the, the flip side of the you know, counter argument is called Thayer's law, which um, essentially um, postulates the inverse, that the uh, good money in time will drive out the bad money. And for me, this is a little bit like... Um, I actually can't remember who's, who made the quote. I think maybe it was uh, Jesse Livermore, like a historical um, US uh, uh, finance magnate, um, which was that in the short term, the stock market is a voting machine, but in the long term, it's a weighing machine. And by that, he meant um, sentiment is a very powerful force in the markets that, that moves the market around in the short term. In the long term, what really matters is the you know soundness, the, the basis of, of that particular um, enterprise, um, and so you know we can think about what. So before we consider cryptocurrencies as monies, let's think of them as, as volatile um, uh, volatile commodities, and um, you know price is actually quite an interesting metric because it kind of squashes all kinds of variables and different things into, into one number. And you can watch this number go up and down, you can 
plot it on charts. So it's kind of giving you a something an objective, uh, somewhat objective, somewhat subjective metric of the, the the state of the conversation between buyers and sellers in the market. Um, now, one of the interesting things about you know things like Bitcoin is we, we talk about these things as having some of the characteristics of money, but the, the kind of price of Bitcoin is largely determined through trading activities through exchanges and through OTC trades and, and, and desks and what have you. And in these places, um, these venues, liquidity is, is actually quite thin. So there's not that much trading volume going on in these places with a comparison to um, you know, for, uh, traditional currency markets or even equities, you know, stocks and things like that. So the prices of these things can actually get kind of pushed around and you sometimes see this in the market that it doesn't take that much to really move these, these, these prices. Um, and so, um, you know, coming back to this, this idea of, of um, you know, monetary economics and whether something is a good or a bad money, um, and you're tying that to the Gogarty and Johnson network capital uh, idea, if people think that there's a speculative utility in holding a particular monetary good, mm -hmm. you know, pseudo monetary good, commodity good, whatever you want to say, um, they may hold on to that for the potential. Um, upside, speculative potential. So if I have um, pounds in my pocket and I have silver coins in my pocket, I may elect to spend the pounds because I believe the pounds to be worth less in the near future, definitely with Brexit. That is the trend that seems to be continuing. Um, so it does make sense that uh, in the end, you would rather keep the most, the thing with the most potential future value and you want to spend the thing that doesn't have so much value. And we can look at um, uh, countries that, and, and monetary systems that are undergoing high levels of, of inflation. So, you know, Argentina is 30 to 40 percent inflation. Venezuela is in hyperinflation. Zimbabwe has had several bouts of hyperinflation. In these situations, as soon as you would receive money, you would run onto the street to try and spend it because you, it does not hold its value. And so, you would not want to hold bolivars. Indeed, you can see videos of um, the streets of Caracas lined with banknotes. You know, it's not even. Um, I, I think it costs more to buy a roll of toilet paper than to just use the money. So this is like to the point where the bad money has been driven out. So I guess you can say that you are seeing a kind of phase law situation in um, in Venezuela, and people are probably holding USD in paper or digital forms. Mm -hmm. Some people are using cryptocurrency. It's probably not that much, um, but it's maybe arguably more than a lot of Western countries because the necessity of the situation demands it. So I think we can look to these economies which are having these kind of partial monetary collapses to try and get an indication of how Gresham's law, Thayer's law, this idea of bad money driving out good, or the inverse, might, might, might be underway. A lot of this, what we're, what we're talking about, is ultimately superseded by the fact that it's humans using these things, these, these networks, the networks of humans. So if humans engage in this collective uh, myth or this collective belief, um, that, you know, you can call it a community, you can call it an ecosystem, you can call it a cult, you know, a shared set of beliefs and myths. If people engage in that together and collectively agree that something has value, then it's very hard to stop them from thinking that. So there are some people that think um, baseball cards are very valuable, some people that think that, um, uh, you know, all pieces of furniture are valuable, some people collect old books, so I used to collect stamps when I was young. So it's all about um, what you think is valuable. So this is coming back to the uh, Gogarty and Johnson work about network theory of value. They um, have this nice kind of temporal, time-based lens of thinking about these things. So um, in the past, the like price is objective. We know what the price of Bitcoin was yesterday. It's very easy to know that. In the moment, the price of something depends on so many different factors, like you and I are transacting. It depends on what happens in that moment. We come to agreement over becomes the, the, the price in that moment. And then in the future, the future is uncertain. But a lot of these things are determined by, by us, by people. Whether we adopt these things, whether we give them, uh, we consider them valuable, whether um, ecosystems to facilitate the exchange and, and trade of these things uh, uh, develop as well. So I think largely, you know, you need to have some sound foundations as a protocol, whether it's gold or USD or, or Bitcoin or anything else. But largely, you know, at the end of the day, if humans don't agree and believe that these enough humans don't agree and believe these things have value, then they'll be um, very limited in their 
in their scope. So I think it's it's largely a social and human phenomenon. Mm. 